you've seen on page one the total of the estrogens and then the progesterone as a serum equivalent for female patients. So as we dig into page three, we can see the detailed breakdown of all of these hormones. So starting with progesterone, we can see there are two primary metabolites here. So the reason there's no number listed here for progesterone is because again, it's not in urine. It has to get turned into these other metabolites before you see it in urine. So these metabolites have been shown both by us and in research studies that to correlate really well with serum progesterone. Each one of them represents about half of the progesterone that's produced. So we measure beta pregnant dial and alpha pregnant dial. So if the beta pregnant dial is on the higher side and the alpha is on the lower side, then we're plotting here for progesterone, basically a weighted average of the two. And then again, we can extrapolate a serum equivalent for that that you see on the summary page for female patients. Now we wanna look at these numbers relative to, of course, the reference range. So if we're looking at a female patient that is in the premenopausal phase of life and is collecting this in the luteal phase, that's that latter third of the cycle, day 19, 20, 21, we should expect to see her, if there's good strong ovulation and progesterone production, we should see her up between these two stars. So a good strong progesterone will put a woman up in this upper part of the range. So we can evaluate that, and as we get then to women who are not cycling, say they're on birth control or they're past the menopausal phase, so they're postmenopausal, then we expect to see their levels not up in here because they're not ovulating. We expect to see them down in this little purple band uh, once they're in that phase of life because again, they're not ovulating, and what's left is really just residual progesterone that's being made not by the ovaries, but pri primarily from the adrenal glands. So we wanna look at those values, the two different values, but really just the overall values that we're looking at. And keeping in mind, when you start supplementing with progesterone, uh, then the interpretation can change a little bit, particularly if you're taking oral or sublingual progesterone. I would encourage you to watch the specific videos to those situations because it does change the interpretation quite a bit. As we move on to the estrogens, we can see that we have a lot of estrogens here. We have E1, E2, E3. Those we consider the primary estrogens, but especially estradiol. That's the most potent estrogen. Then we have the three phase one metabolites. 2-hydroxy-E1, 4-hydroxy-E1, and 16-hydroxy-E1. And then we've got the methylated product, 2-methoxy-E1. So we wanna consider first, what are our overall levels of estrogen? So we can look at that total on page one, and we can also look at these individual estrogens and see how that breaks down, and look at that relative to, again, the reference range. So the premenopausal range is up higher, that's where we expect to find women who are menstruating when they're collecting in that luteal phase, that latter third of the cycle, we expect to find them in this range. So if they end up a bit lower, say the estradiol's at 1.6, 1.5, 1.3, those levels would be considered a modest deficiency for those estrogens. When we get down into that little purple band, now we're talking about levels that are expected for postmenopausal women. So if a woman is 65 and not cycling anymore and not supplementing, that's where we expect to find her. However, if a premenopausal woman who's not on birth control and collects at the right time of the cycle, if she finds herself in this range, then the ovaries are really not making the hormones that we expect them to at this phase. So we wanna look at those levels, each of them, as they compare to the reference range for E1, for E2, for E3, and then now we move on to the downstream metabolism. How is that phase one metabolism metabolism going. So what we can do here is look at the absolute values, again, as they compare to the reference ranges, but we can also look at this pie chart to look at the different ratios. So the ratios that we typically see for these three is a 70%, 10%, and 20% distribution. The 16-hydroxy is a more potent estrogen, so if that one's predominating, we may see things like estrogen dominance, but we also wanna put that in the context of the overall results. So we're looking at the distribution. If your distribution is significantly lower than 70%, then you can do things to address that. Oftentimes providers will use things like DIM, I3C, uh, DIM stands for diendylmethane, 
I3C as indole-3-carbonyl. That's something that's in cruciferous vegetables that's been shown to increase 2-hydroxylation, and it can improve those ratios if they're way off, and, and the 2-hydroxy is much less than 70%, then we can improve those. Likewise, we can also look at these metabolites relative to the primary metabolites. So as an example, if you have a woman who's estrogen dominant, and those estrogens are high, so her estrone's up around 30, and her estradiol's maybe at five, six, seven, and her estriol's elevated, and the two hydroxy estrogens are not elevated, that would be a picture of that phase one metabolism really not clearing the way that it's supposed to. And again, there are things that we can do to look at that. So you can look at the relative distribution of these three metabolites, but you can also look at the, the total of those three just as it compares to the upstream metabolites to see if that phase one metabolism seems to be going the way that it's supposed to. As we move on to methylation, which is a part of phase two metabolism, we're simply looking at the conversion of 2-hydroxy-E1 to 2-methoxy-E1. That methylating step is thought to be protective as it relates to the estrogens, but it's also very important elsewhere. It helps you get rid of catecholamines and other compounds, so it's an important step as it relates to overall health. What are we looking at here? We're simply looking at the ratio. The average woman turns a 2-hydroxy of, say, 10 into a 2-methoxy of around 5. So it's usually a 2 to 1 relationship there. So we're looking at that ratio, and we're going to simply plot that as an index. So if you're a very good methylator, you'll see this index up on the higher side, whereas if the methylation is not very efficient, it's going to be down on the bottom here. And then you can start investigating whether that's nutrient deficiency or maybe a genetic defect. So people have been testing a lot recently with MTHFR, COMT. These are some of the, the genes that are actually involved in methylation. And you can actually test those for genetic defects. And when we see people with those genetic defects, you can definitely see an impact on the methylation. So again, we're looking at the overall levels of the estrogens, phase one metabolism and phase two metabolism or the methylation step. We wanna look at those properly in terms of the context of the reference range. The other thing that we wanna be careful of and noting is as those levels get very low, so let's say a two hydroxy estrogen of 0.4 and a two methoxy of you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, we're, when we're getting closer to the detection limit of the assay, we wanna look at those ratios as a little bit more approximate because the reproducibility of the assay is going to get a little bit worse as you approach the detection limit of the assay. So look at those ratios a little bit more approximate as you get into the bottom part of the postmenopausal range with respect to the ratios. So we wanna look at the absolute levels and the metabolism, and then we should be able to properly understand the overall picture of the estrogens and the progesterone for our patients.